Thank you, sir. Okay, so you should be streaming now. And you are the host again. Awesome. So should that make it open up on the website? Yes. Yeah. Does and that I'll, take a couple of minutes or should it I? Should take about 30 seconds, but I'll, I'm going to log in and double check it here. Hey, Naved. Hi, Lars. We're trying to iron out some technical problems here. Okay. Navet, you joined via the Zoom link I posted, right? Not via the uh, website. Correct. All right. Yeah, Jimmy, the website still isn't uh, showing the feed. Yeah, I'm checking on it right now. I see the problem. Uh, your session's not supposed to start until 12.15, 12.30. Well, right, which we're well past, and I had it at 12.45 in the schedule. I thought that's the central time. When we are central in time, sorry, yeah. I th right, sorry, I thought I saw that Oran had, sorry, I may be off then. I thought that it was 11.45 central and that it was 12.45 us. Am I, am I, in fact, have the wrong thing here? Uh, it's, so, yeah, you're about 40 minutes early. Okay, well, that's fine then. But that's okay. All right. We can tr we can trim this off. So it, this will be streaming. But as soon as the time rolls around, it will appear on the schedule. Okay. So we can just leave it, let it sit here, and it's all set up at this point, and just come back to it, right? Yep. Correct. Okay. Well, thank you for that, and I apologize for screwing the time up there. Oh no, no worries. Listen, if there's if if you have any problems, feel free to to hit me up on on email or. Uh, or speaker support, and we'll get okay. you taken. All right, thanks, y'all. All right, thank you. All right, well, Naved, come back in forty minutes. Yeah, that's why I just message on IRC. <laughs> Sorry, I where's I? I even like I was like Iran helpfully converted this into Eastern Standard Time, and it's all right there. And I think I must have misread it. That's fine. Yes, because he included three time zones in his email. <laughs> no, he screwed up the time. I am going by the schedule on the website, which says 12:30 right. p.m. Uh, yeah, no, but Iran posted 12:45. 12:45 is not. For, he, no, he, he posted 12:45 Eastern in the email that he sent out to everybody. Perhaps Michael and Iran can then join our ESI forum because they're mistaken, right? Yeah, so they thought it's going to clash with something, but it's not. Apparently, so, so this is Wednesday, the 21st at 1145. Okay, so if we come down here, Coral Reef, Magic, yeah, okay, that's fine. I will let Michael and Iran know that, uh, that his schedule is off, and I wonder, I hope no one's missing it. I don't expect we're going to get a lot of people. That's fine. Anyway, I'll see you in like 40 yeah. minutes. Cool.
All right. Let's try this again. Yes. I see we have a visitor. Pierre, hello. Etherpad open here in case we need it. Hello. Hello, man. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. We have one non-ESI person here, but he has been silent so far. Pierre, if you're there. Hello. Yes. You're welcome to say hello. Pierre. There we go. Hello. <laughs> I'll turn on the video. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah. Sorry. I, I am also uh, following a, a talk of mine, which is happening still for 15 minutes, and I, I'm. Uh, just looking at uh, any potential questions. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'll be multitasking here, uh, but do, do get started. Well, so I will tell you right now, you're the only person on this forum who is not one of the ESI developers. So if you have questions for us, this is the perfect time to ask them. If you don't, we're all just going to sit here and stare uncomfortably at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> OK, just a sec. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, pre no, one, no pressure though still no one asking questions so uh um well so if if you don't know me uh, i'm pierre Rito. i work for uh, stack hpc and i've been um, involved in the blazar project uh, ever since it was um, revived so it blazar originally was created with the name climate back in 2013 and that was by a completely different um, uh, set of people, mm -hmm. including uh, Sylvain Boza, who is uh, one of the core reviewers in, in Nova. And then it became inactive. And then we, uh, we revived it. Um, on my side, it was part of the, the Chameleon uh, cloud. And there were also people from NTT um, in Japan. Um, so obviously, we, I, I looked a bit at uh, ESI uh, over the last few days when I sh saw it um, um, on, the, on the schedule. I think what, what you've done uh, looks, uh, looks great. Uh, it, obviously, you have different requirements uh, to, um, well, to what were originally the plaza requirements. Um, but it, it would be good to... Um, to see where where we can collaborate, where you know some we can uh, share some ideas and things like that. Um, I, I think having bare metal support directly in Blazar, I think would be interesting for us. Um, so if there's you know anything that uh, um, we can share between the two projects, that yeah, I think that would be valuable. Min, I know you had looked at Blazor more thoroughly than I think any of the rest of us. Other than not having support for Ironic at the time, were there issues with the model that made it a poor match for what we were trying to do? I think the primary thing, besides, well, the, the biggest thing was the, the lack of Ironic support. Um, yeah. Um, but that's something that I think that could be added to Blazor really easily now. Um, it's a simple ma matter of just flipping, of, of just setting the the, the lessee ID on, on the on the bare metal note now, um, and I, I assume that'll be pretty easily done through Blazor. Um, the other thing I think was the owner lessee model, where the owner controls when their machine is is actually available. Right. Um, I I. I could be wrong, um, so Pierre, please, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Blazor quite supported that, um, if I remember correctly. Yeah, because it's it's not been built um, with those requirements in mind. I, I think technically you could do 
uh, anything like that as a as a, just a new plugin uh, inside Blazor um, because the the plugins themselves they, they can provide new API on endpoints and uh, new uh, manager code um, so essentially you, you can reuse the the kind of the, the, the shell uh, that provides all the you know, all the usual open stack uh, things like database access and uh, API um shared code and, and things like that and, and and just have your your own you know custom behavior um in there so technically yeah it will it, it, i think it would have been possible as um, as a blazar plugin okay yeah. it's i i i might take a i'm a large of you think it's uh worth their time i might actually take another look at the blazer code in the, uh, today and tomorrow um because i want to see it's down anyway um <laughs> It should it should be it should be not down by the end of the day today. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So the power the power outages they've, they've done their maintenance work. Everything's coming back up. Pierre, have there been a lot of changes to the Blazor code base in like the past year? Has it been under fairly active development? No, not very much, unfortunately. Okay. Um, the so there are still some people active, um, mostly in Chameleon, uh, because they they use Blazor in production. You know, every every day, and they have quite a large uh, user community. Um, the people from NTT Japan uh, are not as active as they used to be. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm also trying to recruit people <laughs> and <laughs> encourage them to uh, to contribute. Right. Um, but you, I see that now you've been, you've you've quite you've got quite a lot of code uh, in ESI. You've, you've built. Um, a whole new uh, project. Um, I was was wondering, do you have plans of integrating into the the OpenStack ecosystem, or do you, do you think you're going to stay separate? Well, I mean, a, a large portion of the work is in upstream ironic, so it's already part of the OpenStack ecosystem. Um, I don't think that we've really thought about the long term plans for the leasing service that we are working on. Um, we have some immediate needs that we need to meet that we want to actually get that code sitting in front of people and have people start interacting with it. And I think after we achieve that milestone, um, we'll have more time to spend thinking about like longer term aspects of the project. Right, but, um, but as, as, uh, as kind of large kind of alluded to, like the, the ESI leasing service is pretty replaceable. Like yeah. we could replace it with a different leasing service, and uh, everything we've done in Ironic would still apply, and like user our users would still be able to interact with the bare metal machines in the same way. So um, we're we're pretty flexible on that front. Okay. Well, whenever I get some time, I'd I'd like to look at um, uh, what you've done for for the leasing service and see yeah, if there are opportunities to. Uh, uh, to get the two projects closer, because obviously I, it looks like you, a lot of the logic uh, you've actually merged into um, Ironic. Uh, so this is something that we could that could be reused uh, by Plaza, um, uh, just like yep. you did with the uh, the ASI release. Yep, one hundred percent. Like the the integration between the our leasing service and Ironic, um, it just it just sets a project ID in for a bare metal node in Ironic. That's all it does. So if Blazor can do the same thing, then you know Blazor could also take advantage of our of what we're doing in the multi-tenant ironic space. It's, it's that simple. So it occurs to me, man, that maybe something that would be an interesting project for someone would be to put together a a portable ESI demo environment for people who want to like get their hands on it, see how it works, and see how it works, like a like a vagrant configuration that gives you a controller and two or three nodes and lets you experiment with the command lines and things like that. So that for people who are coming to the project and like, what exactly does it do for me? Um, that there'd be a quick way of getting that up and running so that people could play with it. Okay, yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. Like a dev, dev stack. <laughs> Stack something stack. ideally something even more opinionated than dev stack so that it's basically run a single command and you have a cluster of machines to work with mm. yeah um just to try to lower the bar as far as possible for people who just want to get their hands on it and like see how it operates 
And so one one thing I'm curious about is that so you, do you have um, actual end users of ESI at the moment already? No. We yeah. do not. That's why that's why we we're kind of really focused on that initial milestone, because once we get our goal is to get this in place at the mass open cloud to manage bare metal hardware there. At that point, we will have actual consumers of the code and we'll, we'll be using it ourselves also to operate that environment. So that's we're really hoping to get there soon. Yeah, I, I'm just asking because um, I remember seeing in your slides that the, you only have um, a CLI. I'm wondering how much that is a barrier um, for for end users. Uh, from my experience on on Chameleon, uh, people ma in majority use the the Horizon interface. Right. It's a fair point. Um, so what we're aiming to replace at the MSC um, currently only has a CLI. Uh, we're, we're sorry. We're okay. we're trying to replace an existing system that only has a CLI. So for for now, I I think a CLI would be sufficient, but we definitely and, would be interested in like a GUI at some point. Because yeah, but and initially the, the primary consumer of the system will be operators at the mass open cloud as opposed to um, arbitrary end users who are looking for hardware. So that's kind of going to be a, a slightly more distant goal, I think. But yeah, I think yes, we all recognize that we need a GUI at, at some point. Yeah, it's, it's a big difference if the intended audience is, yeah. is system administrators. Yeah. You know, it looks like we've got a really full forum here, but honestly, <laughs> it's still really just Pierre who is the only person who's not involved in the project in some fashion. <laughs> hey guys. We're well, on. Hey, we're on. The Open Infra Labs uh, one just went a little long, so it just ended. So there might be people joining now. That's right. Um, Ron, we have Pierre here from the Blazor project who has been talking to a little bit about that. Um, Ron here is the um, PI, the faculty at Boston University who's um, been behind a lot of the research that eventually turned into the CSI project. So. Hello. Hey. So are you familiar actually with, um, I guess Chameleon is using Blazor very heavily, right? Yeah, uh, I, I used to work on the project um, closely with Kate Kehi, uh, who I think you know. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I was uh, the uh, the lead uh, DevOps engineer from well from in, in its inception to uh, 20, mid twenty eighteen. Great. Yeah. So we're meeting with Kate soon. I've uh, just been talking with her and trying to understand what they've. Did, what, is it that in that environment it was prescriptive? Where sorry, is it that Chameleon interacted with Ironic as a um, as an administrative user essentially? Is that is that how things have worked till now without the multi tenancy? Uh, so do you mean multi tenancy of, of hardware providers? Um, so the capabilities that that you know these guys have actually implemented inside Ironic now that didn't exist till now so that you could come in, lease a node to a tenant with a particular, uh, with their own credentials against the base environment. Like, so that seems to me like a fundamental requirement, but Chameleon clearly has worked without it. So how have they worked, done that? Well, it, it kind of provides the same, um, the same end goal, uh, but you don't get access to the ironic um, API itself as a user. Um, you, you in Chameleon you can you can reserve nodes uh, through Blazor, but that gives you a reservation of an actual one or many um, bare metal hypervisors, and then you use Nova to instantiate um, well bare metal instances on them. Um, and so it's still multi-tenant, but you you don't get um, access to the ironic API like you can do in uh, in ESI as far right. as I understand. In, in that model, your multi-tenancy is provided by Nova, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Which, yeah. 
So that's that's the main difference in design. Cool. That that makes sense to me. So it does make sense that it, I, I apologize. I had a urgent call. Um, but so it makes sense that Blazor could be layered on top of what we're doing in the long term. Um, I, I suppose so, yes. Yeah. Cool. cool. I just want to make sure that we weren't reproducing something. Like it, it always makes sense eventually to push these features into the base platform, which is the way that I think, you know, Ted's been doing this is that, you yeah. know, so good. I wanted to make sure we weren't missing something because we I sort of felt bad I hadn't reached out to Kate. And... Well, I, I, I don't know exactly what you talked about, um, but uh, because I haven't been involved in Chameleon for the last couple of years, um, although I've been following more or less what, what they've been doing. Um, but yeah, I, I think there, there are some uh, complementary approaches that can be done. Excellent, good. So I have questions then, since go ahead. Do all the real work. This is the um, place for it. So do we have, so basically if I look at what I understand of the project is, is um, we, we've provided the mechanism so now we can properly authenticate things so that only users that have rights to a machine can actually operate on that you know, through these multi-tenancy capabilities. Right. Um, the, uh, and now we're going to go and examine the performance, which I'm really excited to find out how, how much better or how much worse this does than the research prototypes we had before. Um, but the, um, in some sense, it's a very, very rich API, right? That you have, if you want to go, you know, you're talking to Neutron with, um, for the networking side and, and to Ironic for the provisioning side and, and um, is, that's part of the thing that worries me is that really rich API. Now, it sounds like you guys have addressed that in part of the command line layer. Um, do we think we need to address it at the API layer as well, where there's a sort of limited API that things can programmatically interact with that's not exposing all of OpenStack? I'm not sure because one of the motivations for trying to move these features into ironic is to be able to take advantage of this established ecosystem that already exists and there's tools that can work with it and people who are familiar with it and there are libraries that support it and if we replace the openstack reference apis with something special we have we've discarded most of that advantage um, and it helps us still because we can take advantage of those things in our code but it makes it more difficult for people to integrate with ESI then, because then they have to do special things rather than just talking to OpenStack. And maybe, maybe we do some. Maybe we make that an option. Maybe there is some kind of front-end service that prevents that provides a minimal API for specific situations. But then you'd have to write tooling that talks to that, and it, it seems like it seems difficult to meet like both sets of requirements to be able to offer standard suite of APIs that are well documented and people use and also offer the simplified one in a way that is useful. I don't know. Yeah, I'm curious your perspective. I'm sorry. Do you have the same view? Um I kind of well I I, I kind of had a different understanding of your question which was whether whether it would be possible to push some of the logic in our in like the ESI CLI directly into Ironic or Neutron, and then you know, and have that logic at the API layer instead of at the CLI layer. Uh, my my impression, what, from what I've, uh, my impression, of the projects is they're not really that interested in converging to that extent to um, in, to yeah to converging to that extent. They kind of want to remain separate. Um, so that's that's why I think we took the approach we did. I think, and Aran, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that Aran's concerns are more around the security surface involved when you're exposing the entire OpenStack API um, to consumers versus if you can present a more limited API that just lets you do the particular things that 
you know, we want people to do. Oh, I see. And yeah, Yeah. I mean, I can see, I believe there are already tools out there that let you set up a proxy in front of an API with rules applied to specific routes and, you know, rate limiting and only expose particular things without having to re-implement the backend service. So maybe that would be an option to look at some kind of um, front end rule engine that can restrict access to only specific API endpoints. So that rather than having to write a service, you are configuring an existing tool and you can provide it with some kind of you know input that says here are the things that should be allowed. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's definitely the attack surface is one element that might partially address it. Um, it's, um, but you know, just even exposing a richer API than you need to is, is concerning to me. Um, there's, uh, in some sense, I guess the leasing stuff, you've, you've done that is, how is that connected now? Maybe I didn't quite understand. Is that, that's it, itself as a separate service? Yeah, that's, that's correct. It's a, it's a separate service. And how's that? So how do, does that turn into its own project? Or is it, how's that being integrated with the open, with the broad open stack community then? Um, it's, I think that's, that's, uh, that's open to discussion. I think we're kind of waiting to see how well, how well it fits the needs of the MOC uh, of the, of the Hill BMI replacement first to kind of make to kind of make sure that the requirements and the maturity is where we want it to be and then we would take a look after that okay um i think that that maybe the next layer to think about that is um is just right now we have one esi instance right that we're or we have multiple but i mean in in like we we, we're sort of thinking about different consumers of one esi instance but as we go down this, there has to be something that arbitrates when you have multiple ESI instances. So Harvard has its pool of 1,000, 10,000 nodes that's putting under ESI, and the EU has it. So we want the MOC to be able to, or the Open Cloud Testbed, to grab nodes from each of those and have networks that spend them, right? Um, and in that model, there's always going to have to be some intermediary, some intermediary that's trusted for each ESI that, um, for example, knows that it can plumb through this VLAN, right? So you have to know, you have to come to a priori agreement on which VLANs are owned by which ESI instance, and then say, yes, I have, he's given me blessing to use that VLAN on these machines in this cluster, right? And, and that's almost more of a neutron thing because neutron is the tool that's aware of things like vlans and switches and topologies yes and, and so what, what i guess i'm saying is that that there's a you right now have this intermediary for the leasing but, but in terms of we need an intermediary for networks um and maybe that's what esi is is this intermediary that handles the bridging for multiple different things does that make sense? Sure. Because I don't think Neutron would want to, in the same way you're saying that, you know, they don't want to necessarily integrate the leasing service into Ironic and it's spanning multiple things. Maybe that's the same thing for networking. Maybe I can see, I mean, so for, for the stuff we're doing with Ironic, I mean, Ironic has a very kind of specific goal, which is, being the thing that manages hardware and the stuff that we're doing with leasing and ownership and whatnot are kind of a, a separate thing. So it has to be a separate project. But with Neutron, I can see outside of ESI, I can see people why people would want to have site to site connections um, just for purposes of um, integration or disaster recovery or you know distributed services, all of those things, similar requirements. I wouldn't be surprised to find if someone has already started trying to solve at least part of this problem. Um, how do you connect to OpenStack deployments in a useful fashion? Um, yeah. I, so I, I don't know if that means, 
I don't know if we'll have to do the same kind of intermediary service that we've done with leasing and ironic, or if we'll be able to piggyback on top of something that already exists or that somebody's already working on. Uh, I think that's definitely an interesting area of research though, figure out what's out there and how we can utilize it. Yeah, I think Christy looked at some of the projects that, are, that were in that space of Network Federation specifically, so he might have some visibility into that. So uh, there was a project at the time, uh, like an upstream OpenStack project called uh, TriCircle, but nothing came out of it eventually. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's still active. Uh, there were some ways to federate contrail networks. Uh, but I haven't investigated much into those because it was a pain to set up at the time. This was three years ago, I think. Okay. And uh, uh, one solution that we tried was just uh, stitching the open vSwitch meshes together, which works in a very small scale, uh, but it's a mess when you go into a bigger scale. Well, I know this that is the extent of my they've replaced yeah. OVS by itself with OVN to try to solve um, some of the management issues with OVS. And I don't know if that would have implications for what you were just talking about either. But you know, they've, they've been able to reduce the dependency on like the Neutron L3 agents, which has performance benefits for the networking, um, for the operation of the networking and things like that. I see. Well, I haven't looked into this in the last two years. Yeah. So things may be a lot different. And there's also projects like, uh, I think Calico, which just does away with L2 at all. And you only have to use IP addressing, mm -hmm. which might also be something to look at into in this case. So I think that's all fine and dandy for um, stitching things at the higher level, but this has a requirement essentially to look at it at the layer two level where we want to kind of create these overlay networks with VLANs and we want to do it as rapidly as possible. We have the capability, for example, in our infrastructure to come to agreement about fully trunked um, networks. Oops. Speaking of which, I have to run to a federation meeting. Um, I'm sorry. All right. I have to run as well. Um, That's totally fine. Thank you, for, thank you for dropping by. Western Europe here, so it's dinner time for me. Have a good day. All right, you too, Pierre. Well, I think that's all the excitement. Yeah, everyone else on the call is just basically MOC ESI yes. team anyway. So how are you guys doing? <laughs> Well, hey, we made it a half hour, actually. That's not so bad. That's honestly, that's better than I expected. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry that I joined late. Our earlier one ran over. And look at you and your clever background. I'm telling you, man, if you give a man a green screen, he'll paint <laughs> stupid backgrounds for a year. <laughs> All right, well, I think we give this a couple more minutes just to see if any random people shows up and then we'll just close it at uh, close it at two o'clock. Maybe, so, maybe, we, yeah, I have one thing to discuss, maybe. Go so, ahead. Yeah, so I, so the, the thing I think we, we touched this briefly in one of the previous meetings I joined was the security aspects of things, right? Yeah, so like, uh, like, is there a design document or a plan for that? And how are we going to go about it? We don't have a specific design document addressing security right now. And that's largely because we're relying primarily on existing OpenStack projects to handle almost everything with the exception of the, the leasing component. Are there, what are, what are the kind of the specific areas that you want to see addressed? Uh, the secure boot component, that's, that's one of the critical things and contestation. Okay, Min, do we have design documents on the key lime stuff yet? I know that that's on the roadmap. So are you, are you talking with Mike Peters there? Um, 
Mike Peters. I... So Mike Peters is at Red Hat, right? He's working with Luke Hines on the key line stuff. I know. Um, I know Danny and Luke. Um, sorry, and Leo. Danny and Leo have been uh talking. I've uh, been talking to Luke. Um, uh, Danny, have you talked to Mike Peters? Um, not yet. Okay. But, um, so, sorry, so ahead. yeah, we we at IBM have been having like continuous meetings with both Luke and Danny, and also looking into also looking into uh, the secure boot aspect. So maybe we should we should start having combined meetings on that. Like maybe what whatever like these guys have been doing can be simply reused, right? And try to integrate that directly to OpenStack setup. That we are trying. Yep. So, um, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Danny. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was, I was about to say, like, so most of the work that Danny and Leo have been doing, they've been working directly with the ironic team. So, it's if, if, if we want to integrate secure boot with, you know, into ironic, that's probably the, the best place to start, to be honest, to talk with the ironic team on, on how they might approach it. I see. One um, of our, sorry, go ahead, man. No, I was about to say, but like um, the, the stuff Leo and Daniel are working on right now, they've um, they've come up with a spec that's um, uh, with the Ironic team. The Ironic team has looked at it; they're iterating over it. Um, so we, we expect that you know we're going th this this entire integration process is going to take place in upstream Ironic, and we're we're just following the procedure there. Yeah, one of our questions around that whole process is where it makes sense to perform attestation. Because if we roll that into Ironic itself and it becomes part of ESI, it doesn't solve the trust problem for someone consuming the hardware. Because if we so, run if we run the attestation on the server side, then they're trusting us to do that. So we we have often viewed the attestation as something that needs to happen needs to be controlled by the consumer of the hardware. Exactly, exactly. That that's the that that has been always the initial like started like when we started designing esi initially that was always in our mind and yeah. the 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 key is that the re, that's why keyline is the key component because it enables uh, remote attestation and yeah. where that remote attestation aside it has to be completely tenant controlled yeah yeah and trusted not just controlled but trusted as well so if, if we integrate attestation is ironic, then doesn't it just leave it up to the consumer when they want to run it, however they want to run it, and ESI really doesn't need to have much say about that? Sure, but the provisioning service has to comply to whatever pros or protocol is required for secure boot, right? Like wherever, like remote attestation can exist anywhere in the world, maybe, maybe over a secure channel, even over the internet, we don't know. But how that has to interact has to be uh, like clearly defined in ironic. Yeah. So, so sorry. Uh, so you you said that uh, ironic like probably we should be having talking to ironic team about that. That's that's what are you saying? Like I I didn't catch it. Yeah. Um, so go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah, we talked to Ironic Upstream and um, proposed a spec on the security interface and KeyLime interface in order to have a KeyLime driver to do the attestation. Do you mean the, this thing? I see. So is, the, is that a document publicly available, Danny? Uh, it's still on the review at uh, the review uh, open stack, I think. But you can take a look at the at the, yeah. at the, at the review. Let me link it on the Etherpad, I guess. Um, if you take a look on the Etherpad line seventeen, uh, that that's a link I don't, to the. Can you can you please share the link for Etherpad? I don't have it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, in the chat, Zoom maybe. A place. Oh, yeah. it's in this other chat. Okay. I've linked it in chat. Yeah. Oh, thank you.
So line which uh, okay review now. I see line seventeen. I see. So yeah, I'll definitely have a look at it. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing this. Right. Well, I'm going to declare this over unless we have um, anyone else who's got some questions. Going once. <laughs> Going twice. All right. Well, thank you everyone for dropping by. Thank Thanks, you guys Jeff. for the great, great presentation. It was a good presentation, Min. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for leading this forum, Lars. <laughs> it's been really hard work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you folks. Bye. 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 Yes.